The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode number 35. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. Uh, but right now we're discussing Star Trek Discovery in the most recent episode that uh, has aired uh, or released or streamed. I, I got to update my language for the, the modern day, which is the episode entitled Ball for Sharon. Or Karen. Correct? Or Karen. Oh, I mean, in, I in Greek, it would be <laughs> Karen, but that, you know, is kind of fancy for English. Yeah, my wife's a <laughs> my wife's a classics major. She uh -huh. corrected me like three times this weekend, and I still got it wrong. So, yeah. <laughs> Karen, uh, joining me today on the panel, as you heard, and as always, are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Good. So, folks, uh, remember to like the Secrets of Star Trek on Facebook uh, at the StarQuest Media Facebook page. In fact, if you go to facebook dot com slash StarQuest Media, you'll find us there. Uh, you can retweet it on Twitter at SQPN. Leave us comments on the shows. We love to get your feedback. We're looking for more. We want to interact with you uh, on this, and you'll hear some feedback at the end of the episode. Uh, be sure, if you have not yet done so, subscribe in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app. Mine is Overcast. You might like Pocket Cast uh, or the Apple Podcast app. Or you can subscribe on YouTube, where you should hit the bell to make sure you get notifications uh, when we post a new episode. And above all, please share the podcast with your friends, your your tricky friends out there who have not had the pleasure of joining us in this conversation. We want to, uh, to, to have more folks be part of this fun that we're having, especially with new Star Trek TV. Uh, we, we love to, to talk to them about that. And, you know, let's grow this community of listeners. Uh, one one little bit of promotion, self-promotion here, folks. Uh, if you are not yet, have you not yet listened to or tried out our new show, The Secrets of Technology, where Father Corey joins me as well oh, as yes. some other folks. <clears throat> we do that every week and we approach tech news from a uh, particular point of view, a Catholic point of view. Uh, it would probably unlike any other uh, tech news show out there. So give it a, ch uh, a try. Go to sqpn.com slash technology and uh, check it out. So, so, so all that, the businesses I So that means yep. what? You like sprinkle holy water on the technology? Basically, we, we, we declare we, we it all do, uh, from the devil. We do until, <laughs> the, until the holy smoke comes out. Then then we stop doing it. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, do not dip your phone in the holy water font. So it's kind that, of an alternative incense system. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. When you release the smoke, it goes up to God, and your and your phone and we, goes. We to have the cast out the demon of the technology. No I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Enough silliness. So uh, this week's episode um, is an O-ball for uh, Karen. Uh, and they it was, didn't uh, explain the title during the show. I was a little surprised. I exactly. It's a it's a title. I was gonna I was gonna bring that up because it's a title that is in reference to something that no, that never gets explicitly explained. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about what the title episode is referring to. Yeah. So what's an what's an obol? An obol is a kind of Greek coin and um, it, a, a common custom. I mean, they used it to buy stuff, but a common burial custom was um, to place an obol in the mouth of the deceased person or sometimes on the eyes of the deceased person. And the idea was that the dead person would then give it to uh, Heron or Charon, the ferryman, who would then ferry you across the river Styx. So this was like his payment to take you to the afterlife. And um, and uh, so we find a lot of, of obols in like Greek uh, uh, burials. It's part of standard Greek funerary goods. And um, and they don't really explain it in the episode, but 
obviously we have a life form passing from the scene in this episode. So that life form is trying to, tra as we find out, spoilers, is trying to transmit its knowledge before it dies. And somehow that's like the O-Ball maybe, but it doesn't make a yeah. lot of sense. Maybe, I mean, I, I guess they're like paying the Enterprise or paying the Discovery it didn't quite fit. I wish they'd given us a little well, more of an explanation. Well, in fact, there's, I think there's possibly three uh, 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 ways that it applies in this mm -hmm. episode. Um, we also have the, Saru, the, the May yeah, alien. The May alien, Saru, and this um, yeah. giant uh, alien Sphere. virus sphere. The, the, the big, big sphere. The, yeah. the planet thing, yeah. <laughs> they would give it a name. Yeah, you know, speaking of the Ferryman of the Dead, I mean, this is a Star Trek has had the Ferryman of the Dead before in a, a Voyager episode called Barge of the Dead. We get to see the Klingon version of this, where uh, Bolana Torres ends up on the Barge of the Dead between Stovokor, which is Klingon Heaven, and uh, Grethor, which is Klingon Hell. Uh, and so it, it's kind of interesting to see how they've they've incorporated this this. Uh, imagery from greek mythology into uh, into star trek multiple ways mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of kind of interesting so let's uh let's jump into the episode itself um we we start off with the return of number 1 yeah uh, not riker <laughs> but <laughs> the original number 1 the number 1 number 1 uh wh who is the the pike's first officer in the cage and uh, and in uh menagerie uh, we we uh, it was originally played by Majel uh, uh, Barrett Roddenberry. Uh, eventually, she was she became Gene Roddenberry's wife, but mm -hmm. uh, now it's played by Rebecca Romaine, the uh, actress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they still haven't given her a name other than Number One. Yeah, it's it's interesting. They've given her some personality, though. I mean, there's yeah. a few interesting personality quirks that that we see. She's not as cool. I mean, in her temperament as Majel yes. Barrett. Majel Barrett was kind of uh very cold in cold this role reserve. and and yeah. the new number one is not quite as cold is right it, in fact it, that that coldness was an element in the cage they, yeah. they made it a plot element father Corey, i was gonna say she was almost uh, as we would consider vulcan like yes at yeah. the time you know but it wasn't quite at that time they hadn't developed that yet yeah, and, and in fact, they in this episode they make her quite spicy in a way, yeah, in the sense of literally, uh, <laughs> you know, almost literally, where she goes to the 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 mess hall with uh with Pike and orders this meal with what was it like a uh, ghost pepper sauce or it was habanero, uh, habanero sauce, habanero sauce, yeah, yeah burger with habanero sauce, cheeseburger and fries <laughs> with habanero sauce is like wow, okay, <laughs> she's yeah. got an iron stomach. <laughs> no, so, if 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 it had, if I ghost pepper would be really impressive, although not as impressive as Carolina Reaper. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, all of these things which I have long passed in my days of being able to consume. Uh, <laughs> as a younger man, I might I, if, I might if have you but... ever consumed ghost pepper or Cal Carolina Reaper. I would be impressed. Yeah, I yeah. once had ghost pepper salsa, which it was pretty light ghost pepper, mm -hmm. and it was way too hot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. um so uh, and I won't go to all my tales of my impressive spicy food uh, eating, but uh, but what other interesting element in this conversation between Pike and R Number One is they talk they're talking about the Enterprise uh, being fixed; it's under repairs, as we learned in the first episode of the season. Um, and they make a funny Scotty reference where uh, Number One says, "I don't think Enterprise will ever have an engineer more in love with his ship." Yeah, and you know, mm. oh yes, of course Scotty will be. You know, reference acknowledged. Let's move it on. Yep. Um, and then there's a, a little conversation where we get this once again, Pike making a reference to wanting the holographic communication systems ripped out. Um, and, mm -hmm. and he's kind of and he kind of says it's part of the reason why the Enterprise is messed up. I, 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 I kind of missed that a little bit. I, I tried to listen to it a couple of times. I'm not sure what they, he was trying to say there. It out there. And I think they threw it out there more of a here's why in Discovery we started with these holographic communication technologies. But then in the original series, they use view screens. Well, it's because Pike had it ripped out and Kirk never had yeah, it replaced. That's going yeah. a little far to my mind. We don't need that much attention to continuity. I do right. think I, I do think they were yeah. trying to hint though that the problems that the Enterprise faced when with its computer and everything came in through the holographic 
system. Yeah. Yes. That's what they were trying to reference, trying to say. But it really okay. was there just to say, hey, wink, wink. Now you know why we didn't have holograms in original series. Wink, wink. <laughs> Except they kind of do if you look closely. Uh, what If you look at the view screens they have, like those little... Um, Correct little triangular ones on on briefing desks um, yeah. they at times will show things at angles that indicate that that's a 3d display there Correct. and is a hologram in the proper sense these things that people call holograms where you like see a freestanding figure mm -hmm. in the middle of a room with not on a screen that's that's not just a hologram that's a volumetric display and right, so, right. but people tend to call volumetric displays holograms just because they're three dimensional, but you can have a holographic screen and, right. and, and we have indications both on the original series and on next gen that the screens they have are holographic. Yep. Right. I, this is part of that effort. I think, to, you know, to kind of, uh, you should have a podcast about technology or something and talk about, I know, this. right. Exactly. That would be an interesting topic in a yeah. podcast of that sort. Uh, so, you know, it's, I think it's part of this effort to, to to respond to fan criticism mm -hmm. uh, of the first season how you know one of the things was that the technology was so different uh, that it was so grim that and and i think they're trying to take these steps to kind of mollify that i think you could go too far with that as well i i don't necessarily think they need to make a big deal out of the yeah. technology being more advanced i i don't want to see a Star Trek discovery that looks like it was made in mm -hmm. 1963. I just, well, yeah, that would and, be boring to me. Un unfortunately, there are fans who they expect that since this is set, you know, what, 10 years before the original series, it has to look like it was 10 years before the original series. And, right. you know, you're just not going to get there. It's, you're just not going to get there. You know, the technology, yeah. you know, to be honest, by the time humanity is at that year, you know, the 24th century, discovery is going to look old and dated right time our technology <laughs> and, and, is going to look completely different we don't need to have an right. idea of what the 24th century technology is going to look like 50 years from now the technology of then will look as advanced as discovery looks over original exactly series. so that's so we just have to kind of you know go with enjoy it. what we it's, have it's right. really just a show we should really just relax <laughs> exactly <laughs> take william shatner's advice uh, on that one so uh uh, Pike and number one have this uh, discussion of the, that follows about their a level one invest, investigation into Spock, you know, and something about this whole situation doesn't sit right with her. This whole idea that he killed three of his doctors and escaped. And, uh, I, and I, like, they I like Pike's line to her where he says, I need to know why you decided to detour Federation protocols. I like that euphemism detour yep. federation break, break the rules. <laughs> yes. Yes. Violate the, 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 the law. Uh, and it seems appropriate that the Enterprise's first officer and their captain are the ones who are most invested in finding out what's going on mm -hmm. because they are loyal to their crew. He is a he is a, a officer, a bridge officer on on the Enterprise. It fits with how you know that idea that we have about that loyalty among Enterprise officers with one another, and and it it, it has a real Star Trek feel to it, and I, I appreciate them keeping this element in there of Spock is a as an officer on the Enterprise, Pike is the captain of the Enterprise, ultimately this is a, a temporary position. And I like having that continuing on in, in Discovery. Um so then we have uh Stamets, the the uncannily nice Stamets. This has been, you know, been a little <laughs> weird so far. Uh very different Stamets. He's gone through a life change, I know. Yep. Um and it, Stamets and Tilly uh, talking about May, we ended the last episode with them pulling the the May fungus out of uh, Tilly using. A, wow, there was uh, a lot of it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Was a, but the, what was it? Oh, I forget with the spray that they used to spray like the the uh, the fungus uh, antifungal spray. It's basically I guess an advanced version of that. But they pulled it out of Tilly and they've isolated it, and Tilly now feels guilt over her treatment of the real May that the mm. this creature took advantage of this of of her lingering guilty feelings and you know you think tilly i mean who who's nicer than tilly well apparently she still feels guilty about yeah. she she didn't treat her as well as she should have was well, um, definitely tilly's insecurity coming out mm -hmm. right and we have this real creepy moment where she's kind of leaning against the the isolation chamber and the and yeah. the, the the fungus reaches up and kind of makes a hand 
there. Yeah. To touch, which, mirroring Tilly's hand. Yep. Yeah. Uh, which well, I, I had to laugh. We don't get that paid off in the, this episode. Well, I had Go to ahead. laugh though. You first saw the the blob. It looked like a classic Doctor Who creature, where it's the stage hand in this blob suit wriggling around. <laughs> yeah, right. Because it just kind of right. had random movements that kind of looked like that. Yep. Hey, you, okay, yeah. It, just least, put the guy in the suit and roll around there. At least yep. it wasn't green bubble wrap like the Ark in space. No, definitely <laughs> right, not. Right. But uh, they never paid off this uh, shape shifting thing in this, at least as far as we know. So, uh, you know, maybe put a pin in that. Maybe we're going to see something related to this shape shifting ability of the of the of the fungus. Um, then uh, we get this sort of frame in the narrative here, but this moment between uh, Burnham and Pike, where Burnham says to Pike, "I don't know if I should be the one trying to reach Spock. Mm-hmm. If, you know, if yeah. I should be the one who tries." To- now, by the end of this episode, she changes her mind because of all the things that they, they're they about to experience. But there's this ongoing tension, this idea of this broken relationship between Burnham and Spock, and, and they keep playing it a bit. And it's this, it's the frame for this whole season. Yeah, well, and I, I, I have in my notes at this point, getting tired of the what did Michael do with Spock subplot. I was just going to, I was just thinking the right. same thing. It's like, here was yet another opportunity where she could come out and say, here's what I did. Nope. <laughs> right. I mean, she's hinted at, she, she wounded him so that he would, you know, stop following around like a lost puppy. But, but, you know, or uh, something. How, Here's, or something. Here's, here's my prediction on this. This is just my my prediction of, of how they, it seems like they're writing this season. We're going to finally meet Spock and there's going to be, you know, they're going to be going along and Spock's going to be completely stone cold to her and she's going to be apologetic. And then there's just going to be an eruption. And you did this to me. And, da, 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 and that's when we're going <laughs> to find out. We'll have an emotional Spock you know, because he's in some sort of. Uh, impaired state, mental exactly, state. Exactly, exactly. I, I, I just hope we get to Spock before, I mean, we need to have Spock by mid-season. If they drag it out right. longer than that, it's really going to get annoying. Well, they're running right. out of episodes. Mm-hmm. Well, and they're because you know, they're, they're kind of following him around in space, following his warp trail. It's like, just get to him. Just get, you know, <laughs> just, like, let's cut out the, the middle stuff. So we have this classic, so what we have is a classic standalone episode, in a sense, in the middle of all this, mm-hmm. where, you know, the the Star Trek ship encounters a big space anomaly. And in this case, it's a giant, ultra-heavy, part organic, part mineral, 100,000-year-old sphere that's vibrating that pulls them out of warp. It's yeah, Mogo. Puts them... <laughs> Mogo from... Mogo from DC Comics. He's a planet who's also a Green Lantern. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. so in this case, it's Mogo or Ego from... Uh, yeah, from uh, Marvel Universe. From Marvel mm-hmm. Universe. The living uh, planet. So... I mean, at least, at least this felt like a classic... Star Trek episode. I you could have seen yeah. a next generation episode just like this. I mean, right. This really that felt that part right there felt classic Star Trek, and that that was good. And then we get this Tower of Babel moment uh, on the uh, on the uh, the bridge where the Universal Translator has gone haywire and they can't communicate with each other, and the the bridge uh, systems are in all different languages. And I'm thinking. Why do you like? Why did you just take off the communicator and talk to one another? Like, I mean, it looks like everybody on the on the bridge is from Earth, right? Yeah, they probably I, speak standard. I, I know. I was wondering why can't you all speak Federation standard, which is presumably a twenty fourth century or twenty third century version of English. Yeah. Um, right. And I, I I think that the idea was this is an automatic system, and they couldn't turn it off because right. that was the virus. The virus had it like jammed on. Well, and- it as would make part sense. of the part of the part of Mogo's attempt to communicate yeah. with them, <laughs> and it it would make sense if you think about you know this is a starship crewed by people from hundreds of planets, thousands of planets, hundreds of thousands of languages that they not have to worry about being com- expressly fluent in Federation standard, aka English, where when they're on the bridge doing their job, especially at a crisis situation, they could speak in whatever language they're the most comfortable with at that moment. And so you would use UT for that. And on the other hand, when that when the technology goes haywire, as it does in Star Trek, oh, yes. as we just see right here, and that's got it. You've got to have a, a backup, the an analog mm-hmm. version of that where everybody in Starfleet has to learn 
Yep. If if they are biologically capable of it, have to learn uh, Federation standard. Yeah. I would think that would be basic. I'm, I'm sure they have that, but I think the point is, or I think what they wanted us to assume here is that because Mogo is trying to communicate with them, it's jammed yeah. the system. So even if they are all speaking in right. trying to speak in Federation standard, it's being masked by the universal translator and coming out in all exactly. these random okay. languages. And I think and that, that's fine. It, it makes it for an interesting dramatic moment. That's for and, sure. And, yeah. It's I something like that we would, haven't I, seen before, which yeah. is yeah. nice. I also yeah. like the Tower of Babel reference. I was just going to say yeah. the same thing. I like that as, as Saru comes into the bridge, Pike turns to him and says, welcome to the Tower of Babel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and it was most impressive, all of the uh, uh, actors having to learn their lines in multiple languages uh, mm -hmm. and, and say them uh, appropriately accented. That was most that, impressive. That would have been one of those scenes would have been fun to watch behind the watch behind the set. And, you know, see how many times yes. did they flub up lines and have to redo. And yeah, exactly. And it's, it was interesting to see that Saru's 94 languages come into play that we had referenced mm -hmm. before in a previous episode yeah and there, there were a couple of pickups like that from recent episodes like pike also not being wild about about volumetric displays yep. um, right they mentioned that previously and as a setup for the order in this episode to rip it all out yeah and then <laughs> yeah and then his cold comes comes up oh which yeah it linus turns is out to be more than a cold yeah right and we we get to see linus talk and they also set up the Tower of Babel moment earlier because Linus is having universal translator problems in the briefing right. before we get before all all Babel breaks loose. At least, right. at least and that, trying to make him more of a character than just the one punchline and the the in uh, the in the in turbo, the, lift. Uh, turbo lift. Yeah. yeah, Linus being the uh, Saurian, the lizard, uh, uh, lizard crewman, the reptoid, the, the reptoid. Yes, yeah. uh, the Silurian. And uh, so, the, <laughs> yeah. sorry, all these Doctor Who references. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we we uh, that brings up an interesting point. So that the Universal Transitor issue started earlier. Saru's sickness started earlier. So this the 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 sphere was having an effect on the ship long before they actually encountered it. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, because uh, Saru basically says he's dying. Because the sphere triggered his biological response to being called, uh, but he woke up sick that morning when they were nowhere near the sphere. And, and he, he explicitly says, as he's talking to Burnham a little later on, they're standing in the lab, and he says, you know, that we are an empathic species, you mm -hmm. know, that that we, um, and that he he felt the effects of it before they were even close. And he figured that warp, so they're moving at right. an extreme rate of speed, but he still felt felt the effects a long distance away. Mm -hmm. it, and you almost you almost have to assume that it was seeking them out for some yeah. reason. Yeah, you'd you'd have to. It's like okay, I'm getting ready to die, so you are my designated ferryman. Get over here so I can pay you. Exactly. Right. right. Okay. And because it was for whatever reason, we don't find out why, but and, maybe we will find out later. Yeah. And then it precipitated them from warp. Right. Uh, now we're back in engineering in the midst of this crisis. Janet um, Reno is back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I I just can't. It's, her first name starts with a J. Her last name is Reno. I mean, come on. Janet <laughs> I was about as humorless as Janet Reno was. Oh, did I say that? All? No. <laughs> she she kind of resembles well, Janet Reno, although well, I mean, spunkier. Yeah, spunkier, I'm yes. not the biggest fan of Jet Reno, so I yeah, just, just kind, like of, kind of a character. I liked, I liked the sparring with Stamets. It was nice to see Stamets getting some pushback. You know, I, he's well, he's going on, you know, about dilithium mining, ruining planets and wars yep. to control dilithium sources, which is all oil analogs. Oh, yes. Right. And and uh, and I love uh, Janet Reno's line. I could fix that analogy with duct tape, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah, she insults the mushroom drive, which is great. Yeah. But but also what happens That's in this episode is service by the way yeah. yes but also stamets is like oh you know it's more environmentally friendly gets turned on its head at the end of this episode because yeah, exactly what the the uh fungal may yeah. comes back and says your drive and this is what's going to end up getting rid of the the spore drive for star trek yep. your drive is destroying our get our universe yeah and 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 so it's so it's not actually uh environmentally friendly it's it's worse. for somebody's yeah. environment yes yeah uh, so very interesting. Uh, I I do like the the back and forth insults though uh, on the on that. Uh, that I I did I do kind of like Reno. I have to. I, 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 not, I do. I, the reason I'm not the biggest fan is she seems too one note. First of mm -hmm. all, you know, very monotone, and but also very sarcastic. 
all mm. the time. Yeah. I, uh, well, I think she's I like, like spice. <laughs> you can spice is okay in small doses. I wouldn't want a constant diet of it. Yeah. If they were going to feature her more in the in the series, she'd need more personality, which yeah. was kind of what would Stamets, the complaint about Stamets, when last yeah. season he was one note just like this. So it's kind of uh, th- th- good to see that maybe they'll be able to do something more with her if they, they use her more. Now, the other thing I want to have we ever seen the chief engineer of Discovery? We, we have not. And I was just going to mention that because I was confused. Yeah. I had assumed that Stamets was the chief engineer because he's, he's in charge yeah. of the propulsion for the ship. And, right. And and so when when Reno shows up and says the chief engineer assigned me to come down here and do stuff. I thought, wait, isn't Stamus the chief engineer? So I looked it up and no, he's like a specialist because of his yeah. his scientific background in 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 mushroom pizza. Well, um, yeah, he's <laughs> he's kind of like a you uh, uh what's the phrase I think like a contractor basically to yeah. Starfleet because yeah. he's he's resigned. He's going to go on and do teaching at the Vulcan Science Academy and all that. And right once they finally get done yeah. with the mission. By the way, speaking of science, now, Dom, you mentioned the uh, the Silurians episode of Doctor Who. Right. And you may remember in that episode, we had a uh, power plant that was producing like uh, 200 megawatt or 200 uh, million electron volts of energy, which is like right. the impact of a snowflake. Well, here, <laughs> here we have uh, we've upped our game because in this episode, when the power goes haywire and in engineering and charges up the I guess the walls so they can't mm-hmm. get out of engineering, we're told it's 100 giga electron volts. And I uh, I did some checking and one tera electron volt or 10 to the 12th electron volts. Yeah is the kinetic energy of a flying mosquito. So <laughs> 100 giga electron volts is a tenth of the kinetic energy of a flying mosquito, and so that's what's keeping them in engineering. It might be the equivalent of shuffling your feet across the carpet and zapping yourself on the light switch. <laughs> Less yeah. than that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, where is Andre Bormanis to come in and fix the science in this episode? Come on. Andre Bormanis will be the longtime... Uh, uh, Star Trek science consultant who ended up becoming a scriptwriter who now works on the Orville, I think, actually. Oh, that's funny. Uh, where he's working yeah, these days. They were explicit, though, that that level of power could kill <laughs> us. So, <laughs> well, it might draw a little bit of your blood. It should have just gone with 1.21 <laughs> gigawatts. Yeah, that, exactly. That would, have been, that would have been the right thing to do. Uh, so, the, the systems are failing all over the ship. Saru and uh, his cold and Burnham are running about trying to get things working again. Uh, they assume it's a giant space virus, uh, which which turns out to be uh, basically uh, it acts like a, a virus in in that sense. And uh, Saru, um, he, he, I'm trying to think. It's at this point is when he starts to think that he's yeah he, he's he comes going out to of die. Denial. He's he's mm-hmm. moving into the new stage of Kubler Ross's five stages of dying. Um, right. he's heading into the acceptance stage of what's happening to him. And he realizes he's undergoing Vaharai, which they referenced in the short trek, um, that featured him. Yep. Um, and, but they didn't explain it there and they explain it here as it's when it's a biological change that gets them ready to be eaten by the Ba'ul and if they don't get eaten by the Ba'ul, they get driven mad, or that's what they've been led to believe. Right. And die right. anyway. And Because their fear tentacles, I forget what they call the ganglia, ganglia. Mm-hmm. Uh, are in, get so inflamed and painful that it drives them mad with the pain. Yeah. And he also starts talking about his sister again, which he's mentioned recently uh, to Burnham, but now he, he says, basically, you're my new sister. Right. Uh, and he's... Uh, <laughs> He's ashamed that his race submits to death compared to Burnham, who has fought for every breath. Um, and, uh, and he she should says, be. <laughs> <laughs> this makes no sense evolutionarily. Or very, I mean, they right. set it up the way you would need to. Right. The, the, the idea of a species that is a purely prey species. Um, and Burnham says, oh, I'm your friend, so there's no judgment between us. And um, Well, there, is- sure, there sure has been in the past. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. a lot of it. Mutually. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 and in fact, I have to say, the closeness between them here and the emotional reaction of Burnham seems a little over the top for 
the relationship as it's been established so far. I mean, I get they're colleagues and friendly, but Burnham gets like, you're my only friend sort of friend, like uh, devastated mm-hmm. about Saru here, which just seems a little, uh, I mean, if you, if you really think paid for, I mean, you think about it, the whole events of the two seasons so far has been a couple of months at most. Right. Cause season two started right where season one left off. On the on the other hand, they were, especially after the Lorca reveal last season, these two were the people who were in charge of the discovery and finishing the war. And so mm-hmm. that that's a lot of that that can create a lot of intimacy between people. Um True. but you look uh, at you look at how they they started season one and they were at each other's throats constantly. There was it, it wasn't yeah, a friendly rivalry. It was they they were they were pretty vicious to each other actually. Yeah, but I think they've laid the groundwork given what they went through it in season one that they're vastly closer now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I I I didn't I didn't feel it, but I, I could I could acknowledge you know, we'll that just, maybe we'll, I'm we'll not just blaming on, catch on uh, Michael Burnham being raised in Vulcan and she doesn't have full control of her emotions. Her emotions are out of whack. Yeah, let's, let's do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, so then we get to Stamets figures out how to communicate with the fungal May by using the mycelial network gizmo that he used, Mm -hmm. um, which gives Burnham the idea of how to talk to the sphere. Um, Yeah, and by the way, at this point, the fungal entity is, like, stuck to Tilly's arm. Right. And I'm going, why don't you use the the floodlight you used last episode to just yank it off of her? Because you pulled it out of her lungs last time. Now it's just on her epidermis. Yeah, yeah. They they sort of of seem to ignore the... uh, uh, the plot device from from la- from last week. Um, so the so the virus is the, becomes the means of communication, and then they find out that the sphere came, or Saru says the sphere came to them to die. Um, mm-hmm. That so we get this reveal, and then now here's where we get start transforming into the next generation, where Saru becomes Counselor Troy, and he mm-hmm. starts sensing the sphere's feelings. Oh yes, um, and I'm thinking this is a. This is a bad direction to go with this character. That's not, I don't think we need Saru to start becoming an empath. I mean, it was never established that he was empathic before, as far as I can tell. Well, I, they, uh, the closest they came to that was saying his species can feel the approach of death. So mm-hmm. there's some kind of empathic ability that seems to be related to the ganglia. So now that his ganglia have fallen out, maybe it won't come back. Right. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. That, that uh, spoilers to the uh, end of the episode. But uh, yeah. but me- meanwhile, so Saru is sensing impending death. The sphere is about to die. Tilly thinks that she's about to die, too. And so uh, down in engineering, um, uh, Stamets is trying to keep her calm by singing her favorite song, which is a 300 year old pop song. Space Oddity. Space David Oddity yeah. by David Bowie. And I'm thinking, better, come, no- come, better known as Major Tom. Oh, I mean, no, I get annoyed when the Orville does show no, it's in the it, 80s. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know technically, but it's it, when people think of the Everybody David Bowie Major Tom yes. song, it's Space Oddity. Yes, exactly. When we also uh, had a Prince reference right before yes. that. So apparently 20, late 20th century music is getting a big revival in, uh, in the 23rd in the 23rd. century. Yeah. Well, and it will be big in the 24th when Tom Paris is all over the 20th, the 20th century. Like everybody... Doesn't everybody in the future just love the 20th century? Well, it's like, you know, everybody's into the 80s right now, so it's the same kind of thing, right? <laughs> this would be like being into the 15th century. <laughs> All those <laughs> <Yes. laughs> All right. So um, maybe, well, there are people who are into the 15th century, so maybe what do I know? People who, uh, <laughs> uh, Society for, for Creative Ac- or Anachronism advances uh, in the future. I, so, uh, I, I, like, I like how Burnham is trying to reason out what's happening and saying, OK, this is a slow attack, so it's inefficient. It must this sphere must need something. Maybe it's not hostile. And then she says, it's not logical for a virus to kill its host. And I'm going, do you know how viruses work? That's kind of what <laughs> they like, do. You mean like yeah. AIDS? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like AIDS kills its host. Like vi- viruses, e- Ebola kills its host. Yeah. That's what viruses it's, do. It, and sometimes the killing the host is deliberate as part mm-hmm. of its spreading mechanism. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that, uh, I, sometimes I just, like I want to pull aside the, the screenwriter and go, did you even look this up before you wrote it? Did you Come even on. look at Wikipedia? I mean, that's all you got to do. Now, if they said it's right. not logical for a symbiote to kill its host, right. that's absolutely 100% that's correct. Right. 
Yeah. Well, she's under a lot of stress right now. So we, we'll give her a pass on that. Uh, so May, as a fungal May, as, as we as we mentioned before, reveals that why Discovery can't use the jump drive to get away from the sphere uh, because the jump drive, the spore drive, is ravaging the environment of the creatures that live in the mycelial network. And then she absorbs Tilly boop, yep. inside the thing. And and she also says that the name of her species is the Jossep. And I'm really impressed that fungus can pronounce the English syllables Jossep. Um, and that in their own fungus land, they they have they have morphemes that map onto English that well. Right. Y- yes. Well, I mean, she's she's speaking English uh, right now, isn't she? In, in the uh, it, it, as a fungal name. Maybe Josep is the 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 vocalization of the mental projection of what they really are called. <laughs> yeah. yeah would, this would be untranslatable. <laughs> Right, we'd have to give them. It's we'd have to give them their name because their name is going to be unpronounceable in English. Exactly, if funguses. Right, right. So I mean, they're, they're sometimes you just gotta, you know, say it's the, you know, like we said before, it's a TV show, and yeah. we're, 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 we'll we'll take it. Um, so she absorbs Tilly into this into herself, uh, the 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 fungus. Um, then then St- Stamets and uh, Reno have to get her out. They cut it open, pull her out. And then she ends back up in, <laughs> inside yeah. it again later. So I'm not sure what all this well, in and out was I, about. I, the implication was because the fungus has been manipulating Tilly biochemically to get her mm-hmm. to comply with what it wants. And right. the, in, the implication is that the fungus, once it absorbs Tilly, it starts manipulating uh, Janet Reno and Stamets too. Yes. So that they're hallucinating right. this. They only thought they got Tilly out of it. That's but was, they didn't really. She's still in there and that it's still was still going to be in there next week. That was my thought too I when they had that. the whole uh, you know episode where they're tripping on the spores from that fungal creature and then when they take the shot all of a sudden she's not there anymore. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, total, I totally missed that. Yeah, so it's yeah that I, I agree with Jimmy. It, 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 she, they they really never did rescue her. Oh, all right. I'm gonna have to re- rewatch that one more time just to, to make sure. I yeah to to, to catch that. Uh, anyway, so uh, my my missing that. Uh, I may not have been alone in missing that either. So the uh, I like that the sphere um, reversed the polarity of the field to uh, push mm-hmm. discovery free before the detonation. <laughs> um, the the second doctor what was it was it a neutron uh, third or doctor proud third, third doctor. Third doctor. Yes, uh, I, I was hoping there was some, something about neutrons would come up about it. <laughs> um, meanwhile, Saru is getting ready to die. Now, here's here's a big the, the, a big part of this that I wanted to talk about, uh, which is Saru wants to commit assisted suicide. Essentially, mm-hmm. he's he's <clears throat> decide, you know he doesn't have the baul to come and call him, um, and so he wants to die as he says, die peacefully before the pain and madness overtake me. And he asks Burnham to do the deed with his um, sister's knife that she gave him at the end of the short track. Uh, right. So the short and, track was uh, all to set up this episode, or at least this part of the episode. Right. Or, or they decided to use the short track. Uh, or, or it's related anyway. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, so Burnham doesn't want to do it. I mean, who who, who would? would? Right. <laughs> Uh, you know, she's being kind of forced into this right. uh, act, and he, the ganglia falls out on their own. Uh, surprise, surprise. As and, she's starting to cut them. Right, right. She just barely touches them with the knife, and they fall out. And now, and now he realizes he has no fear, like his, like mm-hmm. the, the, he's no longer fearful of a prey species. And I'm thinking to myself, the, what's the message here? The message is, there's always hope. Don't give up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, like, you know, it, 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 it suicide is is a final act and it it precludes any type of hope or anything else um i thought there was a, a I, I was kind of trying to figure out what they were trying to do with this whether they were you they know, were trying to have an agenda or just part of the episode I, i've seen some commentators and i kind of agree with it that this was intended to be a pro euthanasia message but well, not, they didn't course, do it very well. No, I know <laughs> right. that. I know that. But, you know, this idea that he should have had the option to do that, that there shouldn't have been any problems with it, that when it was when he felt like it was time for him to go, et cetera, et cetera. But, of course, this is a main character, so we can't kill off our main character because this is American right. TV, not other shows well, that do that. I, I didn't have as much of a problem with it from 
I mean, I, I thought that uh, I just treated it as a, I'm, he's not a human, but I treated this as a human moment mm-hmm, where right. um, he's, he's, even though it's not a real world moral request, um, nevertheless, it is something that some people faced with that situation would do. And asking mm-hmm. a loved one to do it is something that has been done in the mm-hmm. real world. And it can make the person who's asked to do it extremely uncomfortable and uncertain. And I just thought it was an emotionally real moment in that respect. Um, yeah. I thought it was less real after the ganglia fell out. And he says, "Ooh, I've, I, my fear is gone. I've never felt like this before. And I'm going, really? You don't remember the blue crystal planet you were on last season where you were yeah. hopped up on blue crystal stuff and, and you didn't feel any fear there and didn't want to leave? Um, right. And he, then he, he and, forgot it because his, his hangover from that. No. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, he, um, but then also... So you're so you've had now this big revelation that the great balance that your planet believes in is a lie, but really nobody else has had their ganglia fall out within recorded memory or within living memory and not gone mad. And you didn't see that and wonder about it. There aren't like secret. uh, The great balance is all a lie rumors on your planet. There was never the way I, I read I read it, if you will, that. It was never established that anybody actually survived, you know, missed out on the culling that as soon as they were to be culled, they were culled. So this this whole idea that you would go you'd go mad if you skipped the great culling was kind of a fearful, you know, if if you don't go through it, you're going to go crazy. Well, how would they know if nobody ever did? And that's the point is it was, you know, a false story. Of course, Hmm. we see that in we see that in uh, our our own world uh, now. Where there are a lot of uh, rumors about the bad things that can happen, which no one, which has never actually been able to prove. You know, they're urban legends essentially. Right. If you, uh, if you, uh, you don't go Kel- to bed Kelpian right now, legends. you know, telling a kid if you don't go to bed right now, the boogeyman's going to get you. Well, that's just right. a lie. I mean, <laughs> and that's the point. Well, right. I I find it suspicious that if this were really. Uh, there are always going to be people who get missed who have mm-hmm. and and right. I I just it hurt the credibility for me. What I did like though was Saru's quarters with all that moss and stuff, and he sleeps cool. on yeah. moss. That was cool. <laughs> I did like that. Yeah, it, it there's a it wasn't just the standard you know officers' quarters that you know that there there is some nod to different species having different requirements in their living conditions, um, and uh, and and that was that was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, also, so, yeah, also so- we got to see Saru with his shirt off, which was interesting because whereas a lot of species have like color markings on their skin, you know, like mm-hmm. dogs and cats and cows and stuff. Um, I mean, they have color markings in their fur. Um, he, instead of having color markings, has these texture markings yep. on his right. skin. Right. Yes. Yeah, so very, very, yeah, very uh, is it interesting. I mean that Doug Jones has made a career out of wearing uh uh the uh, plastic masks and and costumes oh, yeah. over his and and I got a, a lot of a lot of uh, credit to him for that uh, that's for sure. Um so they've got the the complete download of of 100,000 years of uh of this our galaxy's it, dead sea scrolls. Yes, it, it, the, it, it, it probably all fit on one of Discovery's thumb drives. Yeah. Yeah, well, one of those thumb drives <laughs> which will never come back to haunt us in the future because it's going to take centuries to study. Yep. Right. Right. So well, all this it, knowledge it, is it, not really our knowledge. And if they are <laughs> the Dead Sea, the galaxy's Dead Sea Scrolls, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls took unreasonably long to publish too. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so we have this. Uh, we we as we close out the episode, we have this uh, Burnham's change of heart about Spock, where she, now she wants to be there when for him when they find him, um, because of her experiences with Saru in the uh, sphere. Uh, and then we have uh, we we're back to the Tilly and Stamets and Reno, um, where Tilly is uh, absorbed into the mycelial network, uh, while Stamets and Reno have a really bad trip, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, like something out of Leaving Las Vegas, and uh, and then uh, apparently in next week, next episode, they're going to be caught up into that world, uh, the mycelial world, trying to get uh Tilly back and try to find out what is this other thing that May has been grooming Tilly for that's the other thing so uh, any yeah. last notes on this episode 
I like that they uh, talked about uh, trepanation in this episode, drilling mm-hmm. holes in people's heads. Yes. Um, I also <clears throat> don't like their gold foil tennis shoes that they wear as part of their uniforms. Because it's just <laughs> yeah. having that gold foil strip around the edge or silver foil strip around the edge of your tennis shoes just draws way too much attention to them. Mm. Right. Just the whole tennis shoe thing is a little, yeah, it's a little a, 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 a day class A a little bit. Um, but uh, if, Father Corey, any last notes? Uh, just a couple couple of the medical things. Uh, you know, you mentioned the trepanation. Um mm-hmm. They didn't oh. have any kind of painkiller in the med kit that they used to sterilize the bit. I mean, nothing right. at all, not even aspirin. Um, and then, you know, the death is inevitable on this super high tech starship that's got a med bay that can cure everything from the common cold to cancer. Right. And genetically reengineer everything. Yeah. 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 I did think, though, um, I, I noticed in this episode, oh, their medical uniforms are, in fact, white, which, of course, they have been mm-hmm. all along. But it struck me as actually that's a good choice for medical uniforms because it's going to show in, you know, if they get dirty and get stuff on them, you know, right. biomatter and stuff that's uh, in treating people, that would actually be a good color choice. Yep. Right. And that's why yeah, uh, medical uniforms are generally like lab coats and that stuff are white uh, to yeah. show any. Um, Except when they're that... dressing in green surgical scrubs and stuff. Yeah, that's yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, you, why don't, you don't see a lot of the anymore. white yeah. dresses or lab coats yeah. as much anymore. It, it usually is. Even for doctors are usually colored yeah. scrubs. I guess it used to be. Yeah, I mm-hmm. guess it used to be all white. Uh, so we got a little bit of feedback from uh, last time on our when we talked about the last episode points of light. Uh, Matthew Point McLean. Of light. Uh, yes, thanks. Sorry, it's uh, channeling uh, George H. W. Bush there. Point of light. Uh, Matthew McLean uh, commented on our YouTube channel. He said uh, Section Thirty One's control. That's uh, the the off screen character that was mentioned um, is a featured part of some of the latest Deep Space Nine relaunch novels. Uh, hmm. So it'll be interesting if they're looking to bring some of that into on-screen canon. Um, in uh, yeah, they've they've relaunched a new Deep Space Nine uh, series of of Star Trek novels. Interesting. Uh, I didn't yeah I didn't know that they had done that. I have to go look them up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ro Laren is now the commander of D, uh, DS Nine. Apparently, unfortunately, they <clears throat> they haven't released them in a way that lets you listen to them on Kindle or audiobook. Mm. So I haven't yeah. listened to them. So uh, thank you, Matthew, for that. And uh, so let's, uh, I guess we'll wrap it up here. Um, before we close out, I just want to do, as we uh, as we would like to do every time, is we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible yeah. for us to create Secrets of Star Trek. Um, and uh, one of the things we like to do is, is to thank them. Uh, also, uh, every once in a while, we try to uh, give them something a little extra, uh, something um, like an advanced notice or advanced peek at different things we're working on and that sort of thing. Um, so this, there's some benefits to becoming a patron, but we do want to thank them. And today we want to thank by name, uh, Leslie H, Jeff V, Lindsay S, uh, Imad A, and David S. It's through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give uh, that they make it possible for us to continue the Secrets of Star Trek and all the shows we do at sqpn.com. And you could join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What do you think of an O-Ball for Charon? Uh, let us know by visiting sqpn.com slash Trek or the SQPN Facebook page, which is at s- uh, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media. And leave us some feedback on the episode there or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. You can find any links uh, that we discussed uh, in our discussion on our show notes at sqpn.com and we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the next episode saints of imperfection Mm. title that'd be like almost all of them yeah (laughs) yeah exactly until then uh father Corey stika thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of star trek oh my pleasure and thank you dom and jimmy aiken thank you as well thank you and live long and prosper and once again i'm dom bettinelli thank you for listening to the secrets of star trek on star quest and remember you don't know me, Doc. I'm uninsultable, especially by a guy who thinks he can run a ship on mushrooms that I pick off my pizza. <laughs> <laughs>